What is the difference between sensus fidei and sensus fidelium? Well, it's just the part of speech. It's essentially the same thing. It's the sense of the faith. It's that which the faithful at large have in their heart, that sense for the faith which is revealed by God. You know, it's the act of the Holy Spirit. It's essentially the same thing. Dear Father, <laughs> how does one respond to a, uh, to a person who refers to God as she? Well, I'm not going to get greatly into that because at a different time we're going to cover things like that in more depth. But I, I just have this to say. Divinity, God, contains both masculine and fem feminine, okay? God is not in terms of gender. God transcends gender. He's not merely masculine or feminine. He transcends gender. All came from God. He's the author of all that is. He's the creator. The reason we call God our Father and refer to Jesus as him or he is because God has revealed himself to us as Father, as Father, and as Son, and as Holy Spirit. And the bottom line is, folks, I don't have a better idea than God. <laughs> <clears throat> Dear Father, what do the letters after your name mean? <laughs> That's a good question. Okay, S-O-L-T is my religious order. The Society of Our Lady of the Most Holy Trinity. And S-T-D means Doctor of Sacred Theology. It's like Ph.D. for secular degrees. S-T-D is an ecclesiastical doctorate. It's a church doctorate in theology. Is there any truth to the teaching that the end of divine revelation came with the last of the apostles? Yes. Uh, the end of public revelation has often been said to have ended with the death of St. John, the evangelist, the beloved disciple. And so that, the, the basic end of public revelation, yes, came then. But tradition, you know, it's living. I mean, it, it's, it's a living thing. Okay, so there is truth to that statement, but tradition is handed on, okay? It, this, it doesn't end, it's a living thing, living right now. Not, it never became dead, it never really stopped, but there will be no new revelation. With the death of St. John, the apostle and evangelist, public revelation basically ended. All of the public revelation of Jesus, in other words, there won't be new truths. We won't come up with new things. It's all there, but it, the, the thing we have to do is go deeply into it. We have to come to understand what we already have better than we do. Uh, when, when a private revelation has been discerned by the bishop of that diocese to be not of supernatural origin, does that, mean, does, does that one bishop constitute the discernment of, in quotations, the church? Yes, at that moment, yes, he's the authority of the church. He's the local ordinary. He is the authority of the church made present in a local area and we are to obey him. Could he be wrong? Yes. He's not infallible in those kinds of things. However, right or wrong, he's the authority and you obey him. I don't know if you know it, but at Fatima, automatic excommunication was the immediate penalty for anyone who had anything to do with Fatima for almost 30 years after the apparitions. Why? Because the bishop was mean? No because he was a good father, because he wanted to test it, he wanted to look at it, he wanted to make sure it was authentic. Then, after he had done that and the church was satisfied, her children were in no danger, that came off and you were allowed then to go to Fatima and to believe that that was authentic. So the church is, like I said, a good, good mother. Can you explain the place of ex cathedra? in teaching magisterium? That's a good question. I was going to do that. I was running out of time. I have it in my notes. And so I'm going to briefly tell you a little bit, bit about that. That term in Latin, ex cathedra, means from the chair. That's the, the chair of Peter is the teaching seat of Peter. You know that when a priest or bishop 
preaches or teaches, there are two acceptable postures, standing or sitting. A priest can preach homily sitting. The Holy Father often uh, preaches seated. That's a teaching position in the ancient tradition with a small t. So that from the chair means that he's teaching officially. Now what it refers to is an operation of extraordinary papal magisterium. There are basically two kinds of magisterium, extraordinary and ordinary magisterium. There are two operations of extraordinary magisterium. The first is when the pope defines some matter of faith or morals to be held definitively and absolutely by all the faithful. The second is that when a solemn ecumenical council like Vatican II is gathered with all the bishops in union with the pope where they give teaching on faith and morals. That's extraordinary magisterium. But there is a reality called ordinary magisterium. And this is the normal teaching which the Holy Father does as the successor of St. Peter, confirming the brethren. This, is, this can come through in encyclicals, in apostolic letters. That's ordinary magisterium. The bishops in union with the Holy Father teaching what the church has always taught can exercise ordinary magisterium. Do you have to accept that? Yes. Now listen, these people who say that the only thing you have to accept from the Pope is an ex cathedra st statement, that is patently false, a lie. You must accept it all with submission of intellect and will. When he teaches and intends to teach as the Pope, as the universal shepherd of the universal church, we have an absolute positive moral obligation to accept it and to give the assent of intellect and will. There was even an encyclical written which said that we are bound to accept the teachings of encyclicals. And that's church teaching. This is not something you can take or leave. That's not optional teaching. This nonsense that you don't have to accept anything that the Pope teaches other than when he teaches from the chair, that is totally false. That's wrong. And I'll tell you what happens to the people who do that. They are separated from the teaching of Christ. Through that obstinate arrogance, which it's a statement, I know better than the church's magisterium. That's not faith. We're going to go into faith next time. What's faith? Well, faith is, number one, to believe in God, number two, to believe all God has said and revealed to us, and number three, to believe all that Holy Church proposes for our belief. That's the formal definition of the theological virtue of faith. Now, we walk by faith, not by sight. And if somebody picks and chooses, they say, well, I accept all this teaching, but that stuff that the Pope said about women's ordination, when he said that the church has no authority to confer ordination, priestly ordination upon women, I don't accept that. What they're doing is they're picking and choosing. They're saying, I'll take this and this and this, but I won't take that. St. Thomas Aquinas, great doctor of the church, once defined a heretic as one who picks and chooses, one who decides what they want and rejects the rest. That's the formal definition of heresy. And when it concerns faith and morals, essential church teaching, it's very serious. What does it do? It separates you from the body of Christ. Are you still Christian in name? Yes, but you're a dead member of the body of Christ. Why? Because you don't believe what the church believes. This is a creedal religion. We believe a very definite body of doctrine. Now on extraordinary magister magisterium, let me give you some points. A, the bearer of papal infallibility is every lawful pope as the successor of St. Peter. B, the object of his infallibility is his teaching concerning faith and morals, above all revealed teaching. C, the conditions of the infallibility is that the pope speaks ex cathedra from the chair. For this is required the following. One, that he speak as pastor and teacher of all the faithful with the full weight of his supreme apostolic authority. 
if he merely speaks as a personal theologian or as merely the bishop of Rome, that's not infallible. But if he speaks as pope, and in the letter that the Holy Father wrote to finalize and clarify the question of women's ordination, he spoke as pope, as universal shepherd, as in his capacity of, quote, confirming the brethren. That's the first thing that has to be in place for an operation of extraordinary magisterium infallibility. Two, that he have the intention of deciding finally a teaching of faith or morals so that it is to be held by all the faithful. In that, he said it straight out. This teaching is a matter of the very constitution, the divine constitution of the church herself, and it is to be held definitively by all the faithful. Now, he intended to define something there. He acted as pope. He's talking to the whole church. He intended to do it. It is a matter of faith. Remember, faith or morals. This is faith. What is it? It's ecclesiology. It's the divine constitution of the church herself, a matter of utmost importance. Now, those who reject that till this day, and by the way, the sacred congregation for the doctrine of the faith recently affirmed that he did intend to teach that definitively. Now, what of the people who continue to rebel and reject that teaching? Is that dissent permissible? It is not permissible. It is disobedience to church teaching. It is the rejection of doctrine. It isn't merely discipline. It is doctrine. And to reject that is to reject the teaching of Christ. And if you do it knowingly and then with full consent, you're in big trouble. And that's why it ends up that the deceived go about deceiving others and the blind go about leading the blind. When we read scripture on our own, can you explain the validity of receiving personal insights or inspiration? Is this valid? Well, St. Peter said that there is no such thing as personal interpretation of scripture. We interpret it in, in the, the light of church teaching. However, God does speak to the individual, certainly. You know, you can pick, pick up the Bible, you read it, and you feel that God's speaking to you, and there is inspiration involved there. He's speaking personally to your heart. Yes, certainly. But, what, but if you begin to interpret that and say, ah, God has revealed to me today that there are four persons in the Blessed Trinity. <laughs> Right? Okay. So, yes, there's something to it, but, you know, we don't come up with new doctrine. How do we know that Christ is God's final public revelation? Because it's a matter of revelation. Remember what revelation is. Tradition, scripture, magisterial teaching. Well, who said so? The church said so from the beginning. From the earliest times, the apostles in the tradition, the magisterial interpretation of that. Remember that sometimes people say, where does it say that in the Bible? It may not. It may not. It may be in the tradition, with a capital T. It may be in the previous magisterial teaching. Does that mean it's divine revelation? You better believe it. It doesn't have to be explicitly in the Bible. Some people say, well, it doesn't explicitly say in the Bible that Mary was assumed into heaven, body, and soul, so I don't believe it. Brother, you can believe it or not believe it, but it doesn't change anything. It is what it is. Our Lady was assumed into heaven, body, and soul. It doesn't say so in the Bible. It doesn't have to. Tradition, magisterial teaching asserts it to be true. Please elaborate on the correct way to do a Bible study according to the Catholic Church. Okay. The... <laughs> I already did it, so it's easy to do it again. If, if I were a, a good faithful lay person and I wanted to do that in my parish, I would get a copy of the Navarre Bible. I'd get it from Scepter Press. You can get it. I know the local bookstore here, Catholic bookstore, carries it. 
and um, or you can write to Scepter Press. You can get their address, or we can get it for you if, if you can't find it. Get that in the Bible. Read Dei Verbum, that document I kept referring to. Read the Catechism on Sacred Scripture, okay? So read the Catechism on the section that I covered a while ago. Read Dei Verbum, get the Navarre Bible, and, and, and do some study on that. Then what I would do is, let's say you want to study the Gospel of John. You take the Navarre Bible, you open it up. You begin. In the beginning was the Word. And you read that prologue to the Gospel of John. And then what do you do? Then you look down in, in the um, commentary and you see what the church had to say about that. And what you'll find there in that commentary, you'll find the witness of sacred tradition, what the fathers of the church, like St. Augustine had to say, St. Athanasius. You'll find previous magisterial documents from Vatican I in the Council of Trent, in the Council of Florence. You'll find what the church had to say about that passage of scripture. And so then you're reading scripture the way the church tells it to do it, in the light of tradition, with magisterium to guide you, and you don't have to worry that you're going to fall off the deep end. It's a beautiful way to study scripture. What is the best Bible to use? One that you use. <laughs> In other words, pick it up, knock the dust off of it, and start reading it. Uh, I, I don't know. There are many good Bibles, many good translations. The New American Bible is fine. I, I use the first edition of it, but that, the one, it's used in the liturgy. Uh, it's fine. Remember this, uh, every translation is deficient. There's an old saying, the translator is a traitor. <laughs> not on purpose, not on purpose. Translation's a tough thing. It's not so easy to translate faithfully. And in every translation, you, you, you lose a little something from the original. But we have perfectly good translations. The New American Bible, I like the Revised Standard Version Catholic Edition. Uh, you, can, it, you have one from Scepter Press, uh, the Ignatius Bible, which is that Revised Standard Version Catholic Edition. The Jerusalem Bible is, is perfectly good. Uh, I've used the New American and the Revised Standard Catholic Edition the most. Is there a difference between doctrine and dogma? Uh, basically not. A dogma is a specific truth. Okay, the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. Our Blessed Mother was conceived without original sin or personal sin from all eternity. She was conceived without original sin. That's a dogma. Um, the assumption of Mary into heaven, body, and soul, that's a dogma. All those dogmas constitute doctrine. Doctrine also includes moral teaching. What explanation is appropriate, if any, to those that believe Vatican II was a work of the devil? that the true pope was replaced by a puppet. <coughs> I've heard this. And all that went on there was to destroy the church. These people cannot accept the catechism because of this erroneous belief. Yeah, this is one of the sad facts of the church today. It's what I was telling you about before. Many specious construals, false interpretations, of the documents of Vatican II discouraged and disillusioned many people. And they began to think that Vatican II was evil. And then they began to drift away. And they said, I don't want anything to do with that. And then some false apparitions, like the one at Bayside, began to cast doubt that the Pope is not really the Pope. He's some imposter, and he's going to destroy the church. I'll tell you something. The devil's very clever. He will tell you 99 truths to get in one lie. And then he'll get, and I'll tell you, he'll get you with the one lie. And so what do you do? You listen to the church. You obey the church. You remain faithful to the church. And if the church says, don't mess with that, you don't mess with it. Okay? Now, Vatican II was a gift of the Holy Spirit. It really was. But I would do this. I would say, have you ever read the documents of Vatican II? Most of them have never done that. And I would start there trying to go through what Vatican II really said. 
not somebody's erroneous interpretation, but what it really said. And if you do that with an open heart and an open mind, you'll find out that Vatican II was a great blessing for our times. Are all people in all places temples of the Holy Spirit, or just those who believe in him who would be exempt? Thanks. <laughs> yeah, thanks to you for that one. <laughs> Not so easy. That's a pretty good question. Um, are all people in all places temples of the Holy Spirit? Now, all human beings are ch children of God, created in his image. But to truly be a temple of the Holy Spirit, you've got to be in the state of grace. All right? You have to be in a state of grace. That means if you're not in a state of grace, the life of grace has been extinguished in your soul. And so the beloved guest still loves you, but he's vacated the premises. <laughs> What's the remedy? It's called repentance. What happens? He comes back. So a state of grace is required to be a temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, God loves all people. He loves people in mortal sin. That's a radical statement, but it's true. God loves everyone. He doesn't stop loving us because we commit serious sin. He hates the sin, but he loves the sinner. That's a, something we should remember. We have to love the sinner, but hate the sin. Why should I hate my brother's sin? The same reason I should hate cancer if it was eating him alive, because that's what sin is doing. And so God loves every sinner, and he calls out to him, and we should too. But we don't have to like the sin. We can attack that and try to destroy sin and its effects. Do you have to be Catholic to be saved? No. But there is no salvation outside of the church. But you have to understand what the church means. Can a Methodist be saved? Of course. Can a Lutheran be saved? Of course. Can a Jew be saved? Of course. Can a Mohammedan be saved? Of course. Can a pagan be saved? Of course. Why? Because they are saved through the church. Even though they are not members in the visible confines of that church, grace flows through the church, touching those people, causing them to live in accordance with that natural law, which is written in the heart of every man and woman. And so, can you be saved by false religion? No. But can, can a member of something other than the true church be saved? Yes, they can. But they're not saved by their own religion. They're saved by being in some way incorporated into the church. There's only one church. Why did the church stop teaching reincarnation? The church never taught reincarnation. <laughs> Do animals, plants, trees, etc. have souls? Uh, it depends on what you mean by a soul. If you mean the animating principle of life, well, one could say that there was a, in, in Greek philosophy, um, Aristotle uh, talked about the animating principle of plants and, and animals and so forth. But our understanding of a soul is a rational soul. And that means intellect, will, memory. Only, only Human beings have souls in, in that sense. Someone keeps telling some people that when we sin, we do not offend God, but we only hurt ourselves. If this is true, where do, do redemption and reconciliation fit into the picture? Well, <laughs> if that's true, they don't fit into the picture, but it's not true. We do offend God when we sin, and if you don't believe it, Read the Catechism. Read the section on reconciliation, the sacrament of penance. We do indeed offend God, we offend each other, and we offend ourselves when we sin. We do hurt ourselves, that's true. We do, and we hurt each other indirectly. We're all one in the body of Christ, but we do offend God. Jesus came to reconcile creation with the Creator. Sin is offensive to God, period. What can I tell to a person who is not Catholic who tells me that baptism is only symbolic? 
that we are only saved by faith in professing that Jesus is our Redeemer. Well, number one, baptism is not merely symbolic. You have to remember that what a sacrament is. Okay, a, a sacrament is a sense-perceptible sign which affects what it signifies. If it were merely a sign, by definition, it wouldn't effect, make happen, what it signifies. Baptism, when you pour the water, I baptize you in the name of, of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that signifies a spiritual reality that in fact takes place, cleansing from sin, regeneration. And so, how do we know that? We know that because God has revealed it to us. How has God revealed that to us? Through scripture, tradition, and the magisterium's teaching. That's how we know it. It is symbolic, but not merely symbolic. And the answer to, you know, what can you say to them, you can just tell them what we believe, and God has to do the rest. You can't force someone to accept your position. Some Catholic schools are teaching the concept of the historic Jesus. Well, I know what you mean by this. What they really mean to say by this is that some places have taught that there is a dichotomy between the Jesus of history and the Christ of faith. That somehow the real Jesus, the historical Jesus, the one who walked in Palestine 2,000 years ago, that somehow he is different than this Christ of faith today, the Christ of the church, the Christ that we study in the catechism. Listen, there are all kinds of hypotheses and theological speculations, many of which shouldn't be given the light of day. In recent years, many vacuous hypotheses have been put forth as though it were a postulate, an axiom, not true. There's only one Jesus. And the Jesus of history is the Christ of faith. There's only one Jesus. And so don't let the devil divide the Jesus of history from the Christ of your faith. Do babies or aborted babies become angels when they die? No, they do not. Angels are angels. Human beings are human beings. And they don't interchange. Angels stay angels, human beings stay human beings. Also, why are angels often pictured by artists with wings? I thought they had no bodies. <clears throat> well, those renderings of artists are meant to convey a reality. Remember what I said to you about the mission of angels, their messengers, that the word angel means messenger? That's why they have wings in art because they're messengers, winged messengers of God. But, you know, the speed of thought is how they travel. No, they don't have bodies, and they're depicted in art that way to transmit to us that concept, that reality, that they are messengers of God. Are you related to Sean Connery? <laughs> Just wondering. Thank you. No. <laughs> Since Jesus is God, why then did he say, only the Father knows when the end will come? It's a very good question. Jesus is indeed God. And his statement that only the Father knows the hour or the day isn't an admission of ignorance. What it is, and this is in the Catechism, that section that I just covered, the last hour that I taught, and you can find this in the Catechism. That's a statement that basically means it doesn't involve my mission to tell you that. That's not part of Revelation. You don't need to know that. Jesus as God knows all things or he couldn't be God. So does Jesus as God know the hour and the time? Absolutely. But it wasn't his mission to reveal it to us at that time. And that's why he said that it's for the Father. Because the Father, remember what he said. He said, I have come to teach what the Father sent me. I don't teach my own thing. I teach what the Father has given me. He was on a mission for the Father. OK, <clears throat> can you say a few words about church and almonds? It doesn't seem to have any place in scripture. Many things don't have 
an explicit reference in Scripture, but that doesn't mean that they're not part of tradition with a capital T. Now remember, I, I taught this last time, divine revelation comes to us as sacred tradition as well as sacred scripture. And sacred tradition is to be given the same esteem as sacred scripture. The tradition is the oral teaching which Jesus handed on to his apostles and which they handed on to their successors the bishops. Many of the things the church teach you can't find explicitly in scripture, but it doesn't matter. It's in tradition and magisterial teaching. Remember, that's God's revelation. There's no such thing as sola scriptura, because if there was, then you could show me in the Bible where it says that, and you can't, because it's not there. And so annulments, yes, there have always been the possibility. What is an annulment? That's basically after an investigation the church declares that a marriage never existed, that at the time of the marriage, that the parties that were entering into that marriage didn't have capacity to give consent. Maybe they were immature. Maybe they had some kind of a defect, psychologically or otherwise. But usually it's because they didn't have capacity to consent. And the church declares that at that moment, they didn't enter into a valid marriage. It doesn't do away with a marriage, because if there were a marriage validly from the beginning, let no man put that asunder. The church, nobody could separate it. A decree of nullity, an annulment, simply states that after investigation, the church finds that the people just weren't married. And it's just a formal statement to that effect. But it doesn't end a marriage. You can't end a valid marriage. Death is the only thing that does that. You say that human beings are noble and dignified. <clears throat> How do you interpret what some of the saints said, say when they say, I am nothing, and there's no good in me, Lord, I am full of wickedness, etc.? And how does humility fit into this teaching? That's a very good question. Remember what humility is. Uh, for some odd reason, in Sacramento, I, I have a spiritual conference that I gave to the Carmelites in New Jersey some time ago on humility. And, and that audio cassette always seems to sell out in California. I don't know why. It doesn't sell out every place else. That's good for California. That, that shows that people in California are spiritually minded. Most people aren't interested in humility. But humility, in its essence, is the acknowledgment of truth. St. Teresa of Avila taught that, St. Thomas Aquinas. The acknowledgment of truth, the truth of who God is, the all-powerful creator, and the, who, the truth of who I am, a creature. Small, yes, a speck of dust. I couldn't exist even a second without God. But the truth is also that God calls me to be his son in Jesus, his only son. So you have to, if you're humble, you acknowledge the truth, not just part of the truth, all the truth. The truth is God is everything. Without him, I'm nothing. But with him, I have been elevated to the dignity of a person. And not only that, a son, a son of God in Jesus. Through my merit? Not through my merit, through the merit of Christ our Lord. That's the truth. That's humility. I continually have to tell God, Lord, I am nothing. And you know it. You know, we are what we are before God. And nothing other than that are we. We're very tiny, but you know God loves that speck. He created that speck and endowed it with beauty and goodness and truth. And so it's very noble and it's very beautiful. Yes, I can say, Lord, I am nothing. I am a sinner. I'm useless. I'm weak. That's true. But I can also say, praise be Jesus Christ, because in him I have found new life and I am a child of God. That's humility, the acknowledgement of truth. After death, if we're lucky enough to make it to heaven, amen, do we have a free will? And is it possible to re repeat the sin of Satan? Okay, we do have a free will. I can say this, our free will is set free in a way that is even higher and more beautiful when we get to heaven. 
We have a free will now. Yes, it's part of our rational nature. That's one of the faculties of the soul, free will. But because of the consequences of original sin, because of temptation, because of that tendency to fall into sin, because of all that, our freedom is somewhat impeded. When we go to heaven and come into the immediate vision of God, our freedom is fully set free so that we can indeed love God absolutely and ultimately with our whole heart, mind, and strength. That's the fullness of human freedom. We're free now, but that freedom is liberated in a higher and more beautiful way when we come into the immediate vision of God. Is it possible to repeat the sin of Satan? No, it is not. Can the angels sin? No, they cannot. The angels had a test that only took an instant. Why only an instant? Because their intelligence is so much higher than ours that in an instant they could be tested and it was just. We, because our nature is much lower than the angels, we are given more time. God allows us to fall and fall and fall and fall and get up. Good thing. Good thing. But no, once the angels pass the test, that's the end of it. Once we leave this life and enter into the beatific vision, no. You can't sin. You can't repeat any sin, sin of Satan or any other sin. You're confirmed in grace. Oh, happy day. What kind of heaven would it be if we had the anxiety that we could fall? <laughs> Wouldn't be much of a heaven. No, we're, we're absolutely free and we cannot sin once we enter heaven. <clears throat> You said we are to recognize God in everyone. How do you recognize God in someone who is evil? <laughs> I won't say what the IE then says. <clears throat> it's a certain president. <clears throat> All right. We are to recognize God in everyone. Yes, why? For the reason that I gave. Every human being is created in the image and the likeness of God. That's a truth, absolutely true. We know that. That's part of the doctrine of the faith. But then how, how am I to act then against that doctor who committed 8,243 abortions in the last few years? I mean, he's evil. He's murdering the most innocent in what should be in the, the safest place in the universe for them. Now, how, that's evil. How can I love him? How can I see God in him? You'd better. You'd better, because that's what the gospel tells us that we have to do. We have to do that. Look, if we are good only to those who are good to us, what merit is there in that? Jesus said it himself. Do not the Pharisees and tax collectors do the same? Are we not to forgive those who trespass against us if we want God's forgiveness? You know, we pray it in the Our Father every day. Father, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. I am highly offended by the evil in the world. What must my attitude be toward a doctor performing abortions, toward a priest or religious or someone else engaging in immorality or leading people astray by teaching tr tr untruths? My attitude must be the attitude of Christ, who humbled himself, stretched out his arms, suffered, and died on a cross. Why? For them, as well as for me. And when I see this going on, I'd better go before God and not invoke his condemnation upon them, not go someplace else and invoke the world's condemnation on them. I'd better go before God as a victim. Because remember, we're baptized into Jesus Christ, and he's not only a high priest, he's the Lamb of God. And so if you're baptized in him, yes, you're one who offers, that's the priesthood, but you're also one who is offered, that's the victim, that's the Lamb of God. And so if the abortion doctor or this, that, or the other person is perpetrating gross moral evil, then stretch out your arms and mount the cross, Christian because that's what it's all about. My attitude has to be one of a servant. Remember, Jesus said, I have come to serve, not to be served. And the high point of servanthood 
is crucifixion. And when you suffer and you unite that to the cross, you invoke God's mercy on all of those who are doing that. Listen, in my day, I was a mighty evil person. Some people think I still am. But, <laughs> but really, you know, I, I did a lot of bad things. I was violent and immoral and deserved God's condemnation. But you know, somewhere, someplace, there was someone, one of them was my mother, of course, and there were probably a lot of little contemplative nuns and other people, good lay people, who were praying. They were offering up their prayers, their rosaries, their masses. Some of them were dying from cancer, uniting it to the cross of Christ. Some of them were giving those sufferings to the Blessed Mother who knew what to do with them and what happened. My immoral and gross life was transformed by the grace of God. And so what kind of an attitude should I have to, towards those people who I just can't seem to see God in them? The attitude of Christ, the attitude of a co-redeemer, the attitude of one who's willing to suffer in order to expiate, not only for my own sins, but the sins of my brothers and sisters. Does everyone receive the gift of faith with the choice to use it? Faith, remember, is, is one of the theological virtues. It's infused at baptism. When we are baptized, we receive the gift of faith. As the Catechism teaches, faith endures in one who does not sin against it. So when we're baptized, do we receive the gift of faith and the power to use it? Yes, we do. If we sin against faith, though, we can temporarily lose it, or permanently, depending on whether we repent or not. And so, yes, when we're baptized, we receive the gift of faith. But it's not automatic that we always have it. You know, many, many an innocent babe who was baptized doesn't have the faith today. Why? Because they sin against faith, and they lose it. You know, the Blessed Trinity dwells within those who are in a state of grace. But those who sin seriously evict the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We can be reconciled through repentance. And God wills that we all be in union with him. But faith perdures in those who do not sin against it, the Catechism teaches. If we do sin against faith, if we sin seriously in any way, we repent. That's all. We repent, we come back to God, and we accept his reconciliation and his grace. <clears throat> what is the church's belief and teaching on evolution? Can it be intermixed with creation? <clears throat> Absolutely speaking, the theory, and it is a theory, of evolution possibly can be reconciled with our belief in creation. Now, you have to understand that science today doesn't widely accept the theory of evolution. There are a great many scientists who've written that off. That's old news. They don't buy it anymore. And so even science isn't so sure about evolution. The church doesn't teach on it one way or another. Could it be squared with creation? It could in some way. We don't know how. But what we believe is that God created our a first set of parents. We call them Adam and Eve, which is what the Bible calls them. But a first set of parents, male and female, all humanity is descended from that one set of parents. Now, how any other factors that come in, fine. If it's authentic science and it enters authentically into the truth, it will square perfectly with the faith. It has to, because what part has the darkness and the light? Truth is one, integral, univocal. And so the church doesn't teach one way or another. Is it possible that evolution, if it were sorted out and understood properly, could somehow square with creation? Yes, it's possible. Do we know? We don't know. It hasn't been sorted out yet. And so what we believe is we came from a first set of parents. We say Adam and Eve, whatever their names were, 
that language in the book of Genesis. That's not the important thing. The important thing is the reality behind the language. Is the new catechism a one, correction of, two, an improvement upon, or three, a replacement of the old Baltimore catechism? Well, the catechism of the Catholic Church is just what it says, the catechism of the Catholic Church. It's a universal catechism given to us by the universal church. The Baltimore catechism was a wonderful catechism for a certain time in history for this country. Came out of the plenary councils of Baltimore. It was very useful. It would be what's called a local catechism. The catechism of the Catholic Church isn't meant to replace local catechisms. Out of the catechism of the Catholic Church, local catechisms will be derived which must, in their essence, teach what the Catechism of the Catholic Church teaches. Now, obviously, you don't teach first or second grade catechism straight out of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Certainly, books will be written for each of the age levels, and, and that's okay. There's no problem with that. So the Catechism of the Catholic Church doesn't replace local catechisms. It says so right in the beginning of it. But it is a sure norm for teaching the faith. And that means that no catechism can contradict or get around the essential teaching found in the catechism of the Catholic Church. In a sense, it's an improvement in that it is more contemporary. <clears throat> Does it change the unchangeable teaching of the faith? No. Does it present it better? Yes. If it was written, if we use this in the 18th century, if that had been possible, it wouldn't have been better because the 18th century, people understood things with an 18th century mind. This is for the 20th century, for here and now. And in that sense, it's an improvement because it's contemporary. It is meant for today's person. But the truths which it imparts are the same that any and every catechism ever imparted. How do we know the catechism is error-free? Well, we know it's error-free because the Church's magisterium has given it to us. Faith and morals are error-free. How do we know that when well, we talked about it today? How, how should, can I feel safe accepting the Catholic Church's teaching? Yes, why? Because God revealed himself to me through his Church. Do I believe it simply because a man who wears a mitre says so. No, I believe it because God has revealed that truth to us through his church. I accept it based upon God who reveals, who is truth itself, who can neither deceive nor be deceived. That's language from the First Vatican Council, De Filius, which talked about the nature of faith. And so you can be certain that in faith and morals, what's in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, there's no error in there. God shares in our humanity. How do we share in God's divinity? We share in God's divinity by entering into the life and the mission and the mystery of his only Son, a divine person. We share in God's divinity as we advance towards eternity, as we enter into that intimate union with the Trinity, which is heaven, the beatific vision. Do we have the fullness of it now? No. Do we have the beginnings of eternal life now? Yes. What is it? Faith. It's called faith. Faith is the beginning of eternal life. Faith is the beginning of life in God. If we were to know our dignity, as Christians, we would die out of love. If we would know what it means to be baptized, to be brought into Christ Jesus, to be made one with him through baptism, and then through the Eucharist, to enter into that intimacy with him, if we would know that, we'd never have another sad day again. We need to start living what we profess. By receiving the Eucharist, Jesus assimilates us to himself. You know, when you eat food, 
we assimilate that food. You know, you have a nice steak, it becomes part of you, in a manner of speaking. But when you partake of the Eucharist, this bread of life, what happens? The opposite. Jesus, who is God, true God and true man, he unites us to himself. He assimilates us gradually into himself to the degree we are disposed to receive him. And that's a function of holiness of life. To that degree, he begins to bring us into himself. And as we become one with the Son, we enter into union with the Father in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what our faith is all about. Where is it headed? It's headed towards heaven, where the consummation of it will be something that we'll enjoy forever. Regarding angels, what do you think happens to guardian angels whose humans choose against God for all eternity? Hell. Well, I do not know. That's the, the short answer. I don't know. I, I'm sure that in some mysterious way there must be sadness, but we know that the angels behold God, you know, the, fa the, the angels behold the face of my Father in heaven, Jesus said. And so any being that beholds the face of God can't be miserable. They have to be happy. They're given a mission. What do you suppose is going to happen to me when after a lifetime of trying to lead people to God, I find out that some of them wouldn't come? That's a sobering thought. I'm not sure. I wonder what's going to happen to me because of my failure to impart the faith. Some go the other way. Or perhaps I wasn't heroic enough in virtue to draw them. Perhaps I wasn't able to love them when they hated me. What will I say before the face of God when I find out that some of them that had been entrusted to me were lost? The only thing I can do is cast myself upon the mercy of God, realizing that it is God in the end who draws them, who gives the increase, and who brings them home to himself. We are instruments. We cannot do it on our own, and the angels can't either. They do the job for God. They're messengers. They do their job very well. But in the final analysis, we have free will, and God respects free will. Another one of the questions I came across, well then, you know, why so much evil if, if we have this free will? Why does God allow us to have free will? If we can choose hell, and we can, we can choose to reject God, why would God allow that? The mystery of free will is wrapped up in the mystery of love. God does not want to coerce any rational creature into loving him. It wouldn't be love. It just wouldn't be love. He wants us to come to him freely, and that's what we need to do. So yes, God does allow us to go our way, but he does all that he can to draw us, to attract us. He sent his only son to suffer and die on a cross. What more can he do? What do we have to do? All we have to do is accept it. How do we accept it? By living the life we're called to live, the life of grace and virtue. Explain Jesus descending into, quote, hell, Hades, Sheol, limbo, purgatory. These are called eschatological considerations, the last things. Jesus descended not into the hell of the damned. Jesus descended to the holding place, you could say, Sheol, the place where the deceased went. Because remember, before our Lord died on the cross and rose again, the gates of heaven were locked shut ever since original sin. Heaven was closed. Couldn't get in. So Jesus descended to the dead, the holding place of the dead, to release the just so that they could then enter heaven. Purgatory is a place of final purification. It is a doctrine of the faith. It is not something you can take or leave. It's part of the deposit of faith. There is a purgatory, and it is the mercy of God. Let me tell you something. I'm thankful for purgatory, because if it weren't for purgatory, there'd only be two places you can go, and only the perfect get into heaven. 
So purgatory is the place of final purification. It is God's mercy because it's a place where we can be purified and made fit to stand in the immediate presence of God. Limbo, there is no formal teaching on it, but the preponderance of theologians since St. Thomas Aquinas would hold that there is a place of natural happiness where some go who through no fault of their own perhaps, they weren't baptized, and it is a place where they're not punished. If you don't have serious personal sin, you certainly can't inherit hell. But there's no formal church teaching on it. The church doesn't teach one way or another formally on the existence of limbo. That's um, open to theological speculation. Birth control is wrong, the Catechism says, but where in the Bible? How to explain to someone else, Bible Christians? Well, it goes back to what I talked about a minute ago. The Bible is not the only place you look for God's revelation. If it is, you're barking up the wrong tree. Sacred Scripture is one wellspring of God's revelation, but sacred tradition has equal weight. Remember, Jesus taught orally. He taught primarily his 12 apostles. They handed on his teaching faithfully to the rest of the church. Some of that oral tradition, with a capital T, some of it was recorded in writing. Ultimately, we call that the Bible. Some of it, I say. Remember the last chapter in the last paragraph of the Gospel of John, where the beloved disciple said, I doubt that the world could contain enough books that would record everything Jesus said and did while he walked on the earth. And so some of God's revelation is in the Bible. Not all of it. Sacred tradition and sacred uh, scripture together make up the deposit of faith as interpreted by the magisterium of the church. Revelation is one, but the revelation of the one God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit comes to us as tradition, scripture, and magisterial teaching, and no one of those can subsist without the other two. That's God's revelation, and that will answer a lot of questions. So how can you argue it with a, with a quote, Bible-believing Christian? You can't. You can't. You just can't. Why? Because they do not accept our understanding of divine revelation. And so you can't argue some of these things. Because if you get boxed into the trap of trying to do it just from Scripture, you're not dealing with a full deck in more ways than one. Don't do that, because there's more to it than Scripture. Scripture is one way that God has revealed himself to us. It isn't the only way. Tradition, with a capital T, the oral teaching of Christ handed on to the apostles, that has equal weight with the Bible. And magisterial teaching is what interprets that one only word of God, whether written, Bible, or spoken tradition. Last month you said that public revelation ended with the death of the last apostles. What about the second coming? Isn't that going to be public revelation? Well, you have to understand what public revelation is. It's God's revelation of himself to us in what we need for the sake of our salvation. <clears throat> when the Lord comes again in glory, uh, you, you don't need any revelation at that point, folks. It's over. <laughs> You've made it or not. Revelation is what God's given us for the sake of our salvation. And public revelation, indeed, ended with the death of the last apostle, St. John. However, that public revelation that God gave is continually being better understood as the church goes on. As we advance through the centuries, we can delve more deeply, more profoundly, into that unchangeable truth we've been given by Christ through his apostles. Beside each believer stands an angel as protector and shepherd leading him to life. Does this mean that those who do not believe do not have a guardian angel? It doesn't mean that. When you read, you have to, you know, you have to know something about literary forms and, and just how, how to read things, something about language. 
If I say, beside each believer stands an angel as protector and guardian, that can be construed in two ways. It could be an exclusive expression, meaning only believers have a guardian angel, or, or it could be part of the whole question. Yes, it is a true statement. Beside each believer stands an angel as protector and shepherd. Does it mean that other people, other than believers, don't have guardian angels? No, it does not necessarily mean that. There is a, a good strand in the teaching of the church which would hold that every human being from the first moment of conception has a guardian angel. The catechism didn't choose to bring that out because that is not a perfectly defined part of the doctrine of the faith. Neither is it a rejected part. Many of the fathers and doctors and saints would have held that every human being has a guardian angel. Can evil exist in heaven? No, evil cannot exist in heaven. <clears throat> Metaphysically speaking, evil is the privation of a do-good. In heaven, everybody is fully complete. Like St. Therese, the little flower, said, in heaven, there are many size containers. You know, based upon the degree of charity you achieved on earth, that will be your degree of glory in heaven. Some will have a cup this big, some will have one that big, but every one of them will be full. Complete happiness. And so, can evil exist? No, because it's the privation of a do-good. And in heaven, everyone receives the fullness of goodness, quite simply because what we receive is God, goodness himself. So no evil in heaven. Who tempted Lucifer to sin? Nobody tempted Lucifer to sin. Lucifer abused his free will and his intellect. He chose to step outside of God's wisdom. He is he was probably one of the brightest of the angels, meaning the most intelligent, and because of his intelligence, the most beautiful, and so blinded by his own light, we call it pride, he chose darkness. And so no one tempted Lucifer to sin. Lucifer sinned himself, abusing free will and intellect. How do we human beings understand God's respect for the preciousness of life when we also see his allowance of sins like murder, adultery, abortion, why doesn't he intervene more often? Well, once again, when, whenever we get into this question of evil, if God's so good, and if, he, and, and if God is life itself, and he wants us to reverence life, then how could he allow such horrors? Once again, you have to point to a crucifix. In order to ex to understand this, you must look at the cross. There is the greatest evil, and yet the greatest good we ever experienced. Redemption, it's deicide. The murder of the Creator, Jesus, is the eternal word through whom the Father created everything. Creatures murdered Jesus. That's deicide, the worst crime imaginable. But, but, Redemption is what God brought out of it. God, in a sense, takes the base metal of evil, suffering, and then through a kind of divine alchemy, he elevates it, he transforms it into the goal of redemption. That's what God can do. He's a creator. He brought everything into being out of nothing, and he can even bring good out of evil. That's God. That's my Father and yours. He's all-powerful. And so why did he allow it, indeed, to bring a greater good out of it? And that's the answer that you can play over and over again to all the people that will ask you in the course of your life, why then does God allow evil? Why did God allow me to go as far down as I went? Why did God allow me to become the dregs of the earth, end up in the gutter, to almost lose my life, my faith, everything. Why did I have to go that far? I used to ask that question. Right after my conversion, for years I asked it, Lord, you could have taught me you're God, you're all-powerful. You could have taught me after one serious sin, 
You could have made me repent and come back to you and then had me get on the right track. You could have had me go to the seminary when I was 18. You could have done all that. You could have spared me from all the evil. You could have spared me from being a drug addict and being in the street. You could have spared me from being a street person. You could have spared me from privation and hunger and maltreatment. You could have spared me from mortal sin. Why didn't you do it? And the Father points to the cross. And that's the reason. Because I wanted you to enter into his life and his death so that you could rise again. And in your dying and your rising, you could lead my people through their dying into their rising. And so God brings good, even and especially out of evil. Are more angels still being created? Not as far as we know, no. It makes it sound as though men are to be gods. In a sense, Scripture says that. We are to be like gods. Now, are we pantheists? No. God is God, and we are creatures, and we will always be creatures. However, as St. Paul said, we are sons and daughters now, but what we shall be in the future age you know, we do enter into a share in God's divinity. That's a mystery, and we want to keep the lines where they belong. But in some mysterious way, in Jesus, we will become partakers of the divine nature. Already now, we are partakers of the divine nature. Why? We're going to live forever. Your life and mine will never end. We can partake in the divine nature now. You can know the joy of having the Trinity within you now. Blessed Elizabeth of the Trinity, a great Carmelite mystic, said that heaven begins now. My heaven is within, because God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have taken up their abode within me. That's what heaven is. It's the place where God is. And so if God dwells within me as in a temple, my heaven has already begun. And so, yes, we do partake in the divine nature, but in a mysterious way. And only when we enter the vision of God will we come to understand it. Forced religion. I know that at least half of the children in my class are forced by their parents to go to CCD. Is this not forced religion? <laughs> Somebody under 18 wrote that. <laughs> I would have written it in my day. <laughs> you have to understand that even children who have the use of reason and free will, yes, they have to be guided. One of the more unintelligent things that I hear periodically is, well, I'm going to let them grow up and be adults, and then they can choose for themselves. Too late. What does it mean to be a parent? You, you, let's let them play, play in traffic, too. How about a little poison? Eat some of them mushrooms that people got in trouble with lately. Hey, what's a parent supposed to do? Guide the children, protect them, give them a head start, give them a chance in life. Even training animals, people have learned that when they're young, you've got to get to them. I used to train dogs. Now, I'm not comparing human beings to dogs. Obviously, human beings are much higher, but sometimes we wonder. But, <laughs> but even with animals, horses and dogs, when they're young, you've got to get to them. If you wait too long, hard to teach an old dog new tricks, you've got to get them in that formative stage when the mind and the heart is open and receptive. I tell you, if you don't get to the children when they're young, you have one heck of a job if you wait until they're teenagers. You know, the, the common sense and experience tells us, and this happens a lot, people were kind of lax in their early years, right? We're young. You get married maybe in your early 20s, and you're still kind of wild, sowing your oats. You're not thinking much about religion. Then you get into your mid-30s or so, and your, your kids are in their mid-teens or something. What happens? Well, you neglected them somewhat in the early years. Now you've had this burst of conversion zeal, and they wonder what happened to you. They think you've lost your ever-loving mind. And you try to bring them to the faith. Why won't you go to church? I don't want to. 
It starts in the womb. You must begin bringing them to Christ from the first moment of conception. There is something very important about that. Are they lost if you don't know? There's always a chance, but you make your job much harder to start later. And so, forced religion, no. When you're an adult, you know, when your kids, and I have this happen all the time, you know, my daughter's 21, she's moved out, but she wants to do this, that, and the other thing. Should I allow her to do it? Mom, she's an adult. Pray for her. Do everything you can to help her, but you cannot coerce her at that point to do what you want her to do. You took your best shot, and it's not over. You've still got them through prayer. You know, put your kids in the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Our good mother will take care of our children. And don't worry if they seem to be a lost cause. Not over till Our Lady sings.